Welcome to lesson 11 of 20. This logic game, it's pulled out of the December 2011 LSAT. You'll see in the upper right here, game two in prep test 65. And if you don't have a copy of that prep test, you just take a look. Uh, this is the slide we'll look at in a moment. Go to our website, crushthelsat.org, and there's a link to the booklet that contains 10 practice tests. And then after we're done with the top 15 do's and don'ts for your resume, some very important stuff on that list. Let's jump into the game. So what do we have here? We have three teachers, J, K, and L. And I'm going to write them out this way because we are told that the teachers are going to cover six consecutive presentations on six different subjects. So we have, it's kind of interesting. In the past, when we had a sequencing game, it was very clear who to list from slots, let's say one to six. Here, well, do we want to list the teachers or do we want to list the subjects, needlework, origami, and so forth? Well, let's think about it. We're told J is going to present needlework and origami, so N and O, and then K is going to present three things, P, S, and T, P, S, and T, and then L is going to present W, woodworking. So those are our items. And what's interesting here is that the three teachers, each is associated with only one of the subjects. So if we have a certain arrangement, I'm just going to write this out and then erase it. Suppose we had, I don't know, P, N S O T L. The teachers themselves are going to have to be attached to a particular subject at all times. And that's never going to change in any of the questions in the game. So P is always covered by K, S is always covered by K, T is always covered by K, etc. So the arrangement on the top is always going to completely determine the arrangement on the bottom. Here, what we're really doing is sequencing the six items and then sort of attaching the teachers to them. And let's lay out our six spots here. So we have six presentations, write these up here. And then in a moment, we'll look at the rules. Let's see, rule one, K's presentations cannot be right next to each other. So you can't have, all right, K, underline K, can't have them right next to each other. And we'll come back and talk about that in a little bit is is there another way that we could write out that rule we'll take a look at that in a moment rule two s must come before o all right s before o simple enough and rule three t must come before w t before w and now before we start to combine the rules i'm just gonna look up here put a dot by the letters we've talked about so o is talked about in a rule w s and t both talked about we do that because it lets us identify our floaters. So N has a lot of freedom. P has a lot of freedom. All right, now let's combine our rules. Well, here's the thing. Since each of the letters, since each of the presentations is tied to a particular teacher, in rule two, for example, I don't want to just write S and O. S is, let's write a subscript. S is taught by K. O is taught by J. And then how about T and W? T is taught by, also by K also by K, W is taught by L. A lot easier to write it down, be able to visualize that, than to arrange NOP, STW, and have to try to remember who's teaching the subject. Okay, now can I combine rules two and three? Well, obviously not SOTW, but both rules talk about K. Both rules talk about K, and so does rule one. So what can we do to combine these rules? Well, let's talk about rule one some more. The Ks can't be right next to each other. And as you well know by now, it's a great habit to try to create two or three broad scenarios. And so hopefully your first instinct is to wonder, well, since the Ks can't be next to each other, are there two or three scenarios we can create to help us simplify things? And it is worth thinking about for the moment. So suppose we had a K in one. Well, K can't be in two, but we could have a K in, in three. And then the next one would go where? Well, it'd go in, it would have to be in either five, five or six. So we could have uh, so far these arrangements. And then how about if K were in one and K were not in three, but four, you could have another K in, in six. And how about if K were in two, well, it'd be two, four, six. Well, hey, I mean, that's four. That's four arrangements, right? Four different groups. Probably going to be a little too complicated to do this. But what do we want to do? We don't want to just forget about the fact that two Ks can't be right next to each other. There must be some way to, to draw this out and make this more visually helpful. So let me erase the Ks. What we're going to do is, and, and this is a, a way to diagram a rule that we haven't seen before. In the past, you've seen something like, well, if K has to come 
before K, but not necessarily right before it, you would see something like something like this. And uh, the third K would look like that. And if they did have to be right next to each other, we would, you know, we would write it out this way. Well, here's how we're going to write out this rule. Since the Ks have to be at least one spot away from each other or more, what if we wrote K dot, 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 and then a, a space and another dot, 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 K. So we'll know that there has to be at least one space in between them, perhaps more than one. And so here again, the dot, 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 K, dot, 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 K. So that's what we're going to do. First time you've seen an arrangement like that or a rule written in that way, but, but you'll see that in the future and we'll do it that way. And let me erase that. So let's put the rules in the diagram and see if there's some way in which we can combine them. So we have our rule two, we have S, S, K comes before O, which is presented by J, and then T presented by K at some point before W is presented by L. We have our floaters here, N and P, and P is a K, so why don't I write that underneath the other two Ks? So we have P presented by K, and I'll circle that. It's a floater. And then what? N. N is presented by J. So those two can float around. And then that last rule we had, that uh, rule one, the three Ks have to be, we'll call them the Kardashian sisters, have to be separated by at least one slot. They're, they're out of control We'll underline that. That's going to be our master sketch. And so then you can see above, SK and TK have to be sort of to the left, in a sense. PK can float around. And then O and W are going to have to be somewhere to the right. So let's take note, looking at the top here, number six can't be, can't be S, can't be T. And how about O and W? O cannot be first and W cannot be first. And when you start to attach the Ks together, this game is going to be actually easier than it, it may have initially looked. So let's take a look at the first question. Now, here's a little hint, and this can be helpful in other games as well. As we know, we want to take one rule, see what choices we can eliminate, take the next rule, see what you can eliminate. But some rules are sometimes easier to apply than others. Rule one looks like that one may be a little difficult to apply. So let's start with two. Let's start with two. S has to come before O. So you look at the choices. A is fine, B is fine, C is fine, D is out. In rule three, T has to come before W. So you'll see A is fine, but B. Is. So now we have three more choices. We only have one rule, and that rule is kind of a complicated rule. Why don't I pause and let you think of the Ks as SK, TK, and PK. When you sort of read through them, think of S as SK, T as TK, P as PK. And I'll give you a moment on that, and then we'll come back and take a look. So answer A, if you read through it, you could say SK, O, who knows who teaches O, N, who knows, but then TK, PK, so one is out, answer A is out, and then how about E, TK, SK, those can't be next to each other, so E is out, answer C. All right, let's take a look at question seven. Question seven, if T is fifth, which of the following could be true? And it's could be true question, so let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, T is fifth. Well, if I'm placing T, that means I'm placing TK, all right. So what do the rules say about T and what do the rules say about K? Well, look at our diagram. T has to be followed by W, which means WL. All right, so that's T. And how about K? Well, obviously, we've, we've talked about K. The Ks have to be separated by at least one slot. So K goes in three and in one. All right, so what else do the rules say about K? Well, P, we see in our diagram, is a floater. And S has to come before O. So we could, in slot one, have... S or P. In slot three, we could have S or P. We just got to remember that if S were in slot three, O would have to come right after it, whereas if S is in slot one, O could be in, in two or four. And then N is a floater as well. Now, since this is a could be true question, the answer is not going to involve what must be true. T, K, W, L, and five and six. The answer choice, correct answer choice, is not going to involve one of those facts. It's going to talk about slots one, two, three, or four. So just pause for a moment, take a look at that. Answer here clearly D. So not too hard at all if you have a good diagram written out. All right, let's look at question eight. If N is first, which of the following could be true? Another could be true question. So I'll write up my slots here. If N is first, well, of course, that means N, J. All right, take a look at the rules. Any rules on N? No. Any rules on J? Well, we have rule two that OJ has to come after S. 
doesn't seem to do much for us. But then, of course, we have the K rule. So K has to come on. The, the Ks have to be in slots 2, 4, and 6. All right. Anything else we can say about the Ks? We'll take a look at the diagram, the rules written underneath the diagram. SK has to come before O. TK has to come before W. So those can't be last. Only PK can be last. All right. So that's a big deduction there after looking through the rules. PK is going to be last, which means, and I don't think we even need to write anything down now. We can pretty easily see how SK is going to have to come before OJ. I'm giving these people names now. TK before WL. So it's a could be true question. Just pause for a moment. Take a look at the choices. Okay, we made that big deduction that P is going to have to be in slot six. Answer choice here, E. That's the only statement that could be true. Next question. Going to skip over nine because 10 gives me more details. We love questions that give us some details. So question 10, 10 if N is sixth, which of the following must be true? So it must be true question here. All right, so we'll put N in sixth. And that means what? That means NJ. All right, any rules on N? Any rules on J? Well, as we were saying before, we have that J rule. OJ has to come at some point after SK. That isn't very helpful. No rules on N at all. So let's look at rule one, the K rule. Similar to what we were saying earlier, the Ks have to be separated by one slot. In this case, have to go in one, three, and five. All right. Well, what else do we know about the Ks? Well, another deduction here, the one we made about P. SK has to be followed by somebody. TK has to be followed by somebody. But PK does not. So P is going to go in slot five here. And is that an answer choice? That's a must be true. Is that an answer choice? Yes. Answer B. All right. Two more. Let's do question 11. The question is, who cannot go second? Who cannot go second? And if you look at the diagram, nothing's really jumping out. So we're just going to have to take the answers one by one. How about N? And N is our floater and N goes with J. And so the first thing you're thinking about now is, all right, where do the Ks go? Well, definitely K has to be in one. Does it have to be in two or three? Could be in either two or three. So, so we don't know just yet. So let's see, do we see any problems here? Well, in slot one, SK could be in slot one, TK. Even PK could be in slot one as long as, as, long as we had a K in slot five. If we had a K in, in six, it, it would have to be PK, but any of the, the Ks could be in slot five. So nothing really jumps out here. I mean, maybe we'll put a tilde by A. doesn't seem like it's going to be a problem. We don't want to spend too much time thinking about it. How about B? Can O be in the second slot? Well, O is also presented by J. Why don't I actually, I don't like to erase and I don't usually like to write over something I've written, but just a little time saver here. So what if we had O in the second slot? Well, what do the rules say about O? S has to come before it, so we'd have SK in slot one, and, and we were just saying SK, not a problem to have that in slot one. So it looks like that's not going to be a problem. Again, don't want to spend too much time. Don't want to have to fill out all six slots just yet. How about choice C? P. Could P be in slot two? Well, let's see. If we put P there, P is, uh, P is a Kardashian, so K goes there, and in fourth, and in sixth. And actually, I'm going to have a question for y'all about, uh, about one of the Kardashians, um, in a moment, but could that be true? Well, what do the rules say about K? Now that we've placed K, what do the rules say about K? Yes, a problem. The SK and the TK have to be followed by O and W. There's no way we could have another K in slot six over here. Only P could go there. You can't have S, you can't go T, as, as we said in the, in the diagram uh, above, on the top of the diagram. So answer C. Question nine, and this one is the hardest one in the section, J cannot give both what? Now, the first three choices have J in slot one. So why don't I write J in slot one? And, and of course, J goes underneath. And what do the rules say about J? Well, we have rule two that OJ has to be preceded by S. So J is not going to be presenting O in this slot. J is, what's the other J? J N, presenting N, presenting needlework. And then OJ is going to come somewhere to the right. How about A? J is first and third. Well, let's see, if, if J were third, we have this rule, S has to come before it. Well, we, we've seen before that, that that's okay. I mean, we can have K. We've seen many examples where K is, is in slot two. That doesn't look like a problem at all. We can put a tilde by it. How about two? Could J be first and fourth? Well, I'll erase that real quick and write the J in four. Could J be in fourth? Well, again, the rule uh, OJ has to be preceded by S. So we're going to have SK is going to be in here somewhere. I hope you can see what I'm writing. All right. So if a K goes in there, we look at our K rule. 
hey, we have two other Ks we have to place. They'd have to be in five and six, but what's the problem? The Ks can't be next to each other. Answer B. So I hope that explanation helped. Not an easy game. Hope that explanation helped. And if it did, please click the like button, share it with your friends. I'm going to get to the top 15 list in just a moment, but here's a question for you. It's been in the news that Kim Kardashian wants to become an attorney. And I'll post a couple of links in the comments section about this subject. Although I know very little about the Kardashians, I do know that she's been in the news recently for helping to get the President of the United States to grant clemency to a woman who got a life sentence in federal prison for a nonviolent crime, a nonviolent drug offense, has been in jail for 20 years. And Kim Kardashian convinced President Trump to grant her clemency, has a huge interest in criminal justice reform, criminal sentencing reform. And here's a fun fact for you, and I'll post a link on this subject as well. There are four states in America in which you can become a licensed attorney, can take the bar exam and become an attorney without having gone to law school. California, Washington, Vermont, and Virginia. In those four states, you can become a licensed attorney if you have worked as an apprentice for a practicing attorney for at least four years. You can then take the bar exam, and if you pass the bar, become an attorney. Kim Kardashian, I'm told, did not graduate from college and does not want to go to law school. Question, should she work for a lawyer for four years and try to become an attorney in California? I say, absolutely. Should she try to become an attorney in California by working as an apprentice for a lawyer? Should she practice law? And if so, what area of law should she practice? Would love to hear what you have to say about that. All right, the top 15 list. In an earlier lesson, we talked about personal statements. And tip number one was to start off reading a great personal statement right away so you'll get in the right mindset. See exactly what a great personal statement would sound like. Well, similar tip number one here, a great resume in a law school application. What does it look like? How is it structured? What does it say? As soon as you're done watching this video, here are two links to look at. You can Google them. You'll see the titles here, or the links are also posted down in the comment section. The first, on the Harvard Law School website, if you click on that link and scroll down, you'll see resumes. There are three sample resumes you can take a look at. Obviously, if they worked for Harvard, they're worth taking a look at. The second, this is an excellent website in general, the Girl's Guide to Law School, and it's a, a great resource for males as much as it is for females law students and law school applicants, there's a great link on that site about resumes for law school applicants. So the way to get started is, what did we say here? Learn from the pros what a great resume looks like. Take a look at those at those sites. Second point, as a general rule, try to limit it to one pages. There are some exceptions and you'll even see one of the sample resumes on the Harvard site is an exception, but especially if you're still in college, not a good idea to write much more than one page. Third point, since you're applying to law school, obviously what they care the most about is your academic achievement. So you want that at the top of the resume, not just your GPA, but any honors, any awards, any achievements. Uh, if you made the dean's list, you'd want to put that on there. Point four, and this is what an admissions officer is wondering about when they look at your resume. What does this person do when they're not in class? What do they do with their time? And you want to let them know about anything that was a good use of your time, whether it was work, whether it was volunteer stuff, et cetera, et cetera. You want to get credit for things that you've done outside of the classroom, even if it was working as a, as a waiter at Chili's for 10 hours a week in the summertime. Hey, that's more impressive than doing nothing. So you want to put things, any if it's a job that you spent more than a month on, you want to put it on the resume. And that's really point five. Any work that you've done, you may not find it all that impressive, but admissions committees want to know that you were working. Point six, whether it's a job, whether it's volunteer work, whether it's some organization you were involved with, don't just list your title. Be very specific about what you did and what you accomplished. Here again, even if you didn't think it was an extraordinary accomplishment, if it's something outside of class and outside of work, if you had a small impact for the better on anything, point it out. Don't just list your title. Talk about what you accomplished. Point seven, with regard to things you've done outside of the classroom and outside of work, whether they be volunteer, cultural activities, extracurricular, give details, present details, talk about accomplishments, any small accomplishment you made at all. You want to talk about that. Point eight, points eight and nine here. On any resume, of course, you have to talk about your education. You have to talk about your work experience. Makes a lot of sense, as we said in point seven, to talk about other things you do outside of the classroom activities. But on a resume, and you'll see in some of the sample resumes, you also have an opportunity, if you choose to do it, to list some skills and to list personal interests. And you might think those are kind of silly things, but they could be helpful. You want to show the school that you're well-rounded. Any particular skills, you see examples here, language, computer programming, music. In point nine, personal interest, whether it's a skill or a personal interest, if it's specific, it can give the reader a sense of who you are, a sense of you as a, a person rather than just 
a piece of paper. A good resume, although the structure is formal and the wording is formal, also in a way serves as a story. And when I talk about interest, you'll see a couple of examples here. Do you want to say reading? Oh, that's okay. But reading literary fiction, even better. Reading historical fiction, even better. The more detailed, the better. You know, cooking, okay. Southern cooking, even better. Number 10, thinking about the personal statement for a moment, anything you can put in the resume that backs up what you said in the personal statement will be helpful. We'll make the personal statement obviously sound more believable, whether it's anything you did in work or anything, any extracurricular activities, whatever it may be. If you can provide some factual details that, that back up the personal statement, that's a good idea. Number 11, if you see the resume of someone who's applying for a job, you'll sometimes see sections titled objective or summary of qualifications or relevant coursework. You don't want that on your law school resume. Not helpful, not relevant, not a good use of space. Number 12, anything you did in high school, irrelevant. Don't put it on your resume. Unless it was just something extraordinary, you won an Olympic gold medal or you won the national chess championship or something like that, it just doesn't belong on your resume when you apply to law school. Number 13, and this is really important. Creating a resume is not something you can do in an hour or a day or even a week. It's a process. It takes a long time to create one and it takes a long time to improve it and you will improve it. You'll find yourself making small changes all the time. Just as you spend a long period of time preparing for the LSAT, just as you spend a long period of time, or at least you should, thinking about your personal statements, you want to think of creating the resume as a process, something that's going to be done over time and something to start thinking about now. Number 14, even if you spend six months putting together a resume, it is almost impossible to do it without making any mistakes. You may read it a hundred times and think it's error-free. Always have at least two people proofread your resume before you submit it, whether it's to a law school or an employer or anybody else. A resume has to be perfect and you absolutely want at least two people to proofread it and edit it before you submit it. And finally, point 15, we've made this list just to Try to convey some pieces of information that you may not find in other publications on, on how to improve your resume, how to write and improve your resume. But there is no shortage of publications out there that give you additional information, great information. Here are two other links to look at. And again, we'll post these in the, in the comments section. Two articles in U.S. News about resume writing for law school applicants. So take a look at those. Hope you found this video helpful. If you did, share it with your friends. Be sure to subscribe. We'll see you in the next lesson. It will be the final lesson on sequencing games, and it's a hard one. We'll see you there.